Hello, my name is Lee Harris, and today I'm going to be talking with you about water baptism. So, what is water baptism? Uh, the word baptism itself uh, is actually derived from several root words. Uh, the main root word is the Greek baptizo, which is derived from the root word bapto. And it means to dip, to overwhelm with, or to bury into. Um, we'll see uh, some of those different root words. Uh, the word bapto, uh, you can find that in Luke 16 and 24, John 13 and 26, Revelations 19 and 13. Uh, that root word bapto is the word that means to dip, dip under, sink in, immerse, plunge. Uh, the word baptizo or baptizo uh, means to make whelmed or wholly wet, immerse, submerge. You'll see that in uh, Matthew 3 and 6, Mark 1, verses 5 and 9. And uh, it, uh, it was also shown as to be when you're baptized with, the word with is in. So usually if you see a uh, baptized, you'll see it's paired with the word with water, in water, because of that root word meaning to be made wet or to be immersed. Um, you'll also see the word baptisma, and that uh, translates that which is dipped. Um, so you'll see that in Matthew 3 and 7, uh, Matthew 20, Matthew 21. You'll see it in Mark 1, Mark 10 and 38 through 39. Um, it's it's all throughout uh, the New Testament. Um, it's mainly, that's mainly where the baptism was introduced. Uh, there's also the root word baptismos, uh, which means a dipping in water, um, where it can mean washing. You have baptists, which is the baptizer, the one who dips. Um, and you'll uh, see that when they're referring to John the Baptist. Um, so there are several root words, several variations of the word baptism. It ultimately means to dip. So a water baptism is when you are dipped in water. Uh, there are three baptisms for our believers today. We have the baptism into Christ um, and, or into his body. And that's what you are baptized into at repentance and the new birth. So once you have repented and you've given your life to Christ, you experience that baptism into Christ. It's called the one baptism, which is referred to in Ephesians 4 and 5, uh, because it is the only baptism that saves the soul and brings one into the body of Christ. You cannot be made, you, you will not be baptized into the body of Christ without repentance. And it's the only baptism that actually saves you. Uh, water baptism is what you receive after you're saved. So, uh, it's a, it's almost like a signal or a symbol of what has happened inwardly when you repented. And then we have the spirit baptism, which is the endowment of power for service. And this can take place before water baptism or after water baptism. So there's no particular order for water baptism and spirit baptism, but you must first be saved to experience either one of those baptisms. Um, so each of these uh, baptisms has an agent that's doing the baptizing. So the Holy Spirit is the agent that baptizes you into Christ and then and into his body. Christ is the agent to baptize you into the Holy Spirit. And the minister is the agent to baptize you in water. Um, so I like how you, you see that Christ and the Holy Spirit are intertwined and actually the agents to uh, baptize you into the other. So the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ and Christ baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. So I like how those two are intertwined. Another question some people may have, what happens after you are made alive in Christ? Uh, simply put, you are made alive in Christ. Um, I, before we're saved, uh, before we are born again, uh, I, there's a spiritual dead uh, a dead, a spiritually dead state that we are experiencing um, because we haven't been born again. Our spirits have not yet been redeemed. We're uh, in in bondage to sin, um, and the and and we're a slave of our flesh.
Uh, so one of the main, one of the first things that happens or one of the main things that happens is you're made alive in Christ. So uh, we'll see that um, in Colossians 2, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, it's letting us know that the baptism is a burial. Um, it, ex it distinguishes between the spirit baptism and water baptism. And it says there, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism and which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. So if you look in verse 12, it says buried with him in baptism. Even though these verses are describing the spiritual baptism, it's important to note that the baptism is involving someone being immersed or buried. This water baptism is a symbol of that. It's a re, um, a reenactment in a sense of that burial that Christ took for us. And then in verse 13, where it says, we're quickened together with him, having been forgiven of all trespasses. Quickened means risen. So once you've experienced that burial, that submergence in the water, then you're quickened with Christ when you're raised out of the water. So after that immersion, you're raised again, you're born again. And well, you're already born again, but you're made alive. It's that symbolic uh, uh, belief in your heart that you've already been, been saved and you're made alive. So basically the water baptism is a symbol of the spiritual baptism. Um, I... I like to think of the baptism at the water baptism to me is like I'm engaged and eventually I'll be getting my marriage license and, um, you know, that will basically give us the right to get married. And the ceremony is like that, even though inwardly we, we believe we're married, that that marriage is that ceremony, letting the world know, like, we believe this and we want it to be known. We want to proclaim our marriage, our commitment to each other, to everyone else. Um, so I think it's important to note that the water, it's almost like the water baptisms is a symbolic reference and a, uh, it, it, it seals that inward, uh, declaration that has been made. Baptism in water. Who, what is it for? Um, we'll start with who. It was started by uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. Um, you'll see that in all the Gospels, Matthew 3, Mark 1, and John 1. If you look in Luke 1, it gives a more detailed account of the life of John the Baptist. Uh, but they all uh, reference that, you know, John, uh, John was the one to start water baptism. Um, and the purpose of John's ministry was to prepare the way for the Messiah, um, and which also meant preparing the people. So if we go to Matthew chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3, it reads, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So the idea here is that every obstruction, anything that would be uh, a derailment to the ministry of Jesus is being removed. Anything that would stop people from wanting to repent, wanting to be baptized into the body of Christ is being removed by repentance. Um, and it was to reveal to the whole world the sa salvation of God and him whose name is the Savior, which is Jesus. So baptism is is uh it's preparing the way and it's for those who have repented of their sin of their sins and are saved so why is baptism important we're still in matthew chapter 3 uh we see in verse 6 it says that they were baptized by john confessing their sins um so that was preparing them for the coming of jesus so we read in verses 5 and 6 it says then jerusalem all judea and all the region around the jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. 
So this baptism, it's a public seal of their felt need of deliverance from sin, of their expectation of the coming deliverer, and of their readiness to welcome him when he appeared. So it's bas it's almost like that water baptism is preparing their hearts to receive all that Christ is going to give them, to receive Christ as the Savior, as the one who has delivered them, as the one who has redeemed them. They can receive that because they've repented. They've turned away from the things that kept them away from him in the first place. Um, and then we'll see in John 1, John the Baptist is also called to bear witness of the light, which is Jesus. Uh, and you'll see that in John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, it says, This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Uh, so John uh, is making it clear that he is to bear witness. Uh, you'll see also in those uh, in the Gospels that he was showing that Jesus is the one that was prophesied by Isaiah. Um, because And that all the Gospels, they quote the same uh verses from Isaiah. Uh, I do not have it. I have to, I'm sorry, <laughs> but they all quote the same. Uh, they all refer to Isaiah the prophet and, and saying that um, Jesus is the one who was to come to, to be the light of the world, to uh, to take away the sin of the world, um, all those things. Uh, they were all letting it be known and making it clear like this is the person that was prophesied. This is the son of God that has been prophesied for all this time. He is here now. Um, and John was also making it clear that, you know, he baptized with water, but he was preparing them for Jesus who were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll see that in John chapter one, verse 26, where it says, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Um, and if it goes on further, uh, if you go down to verse 29, um, and it's verses 29 through 34, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who has sent me uh, to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So, this is again John stating, I have, I'm bearing witness, I'm telling you, this is what... The, the God who sent me said that the the one that has come to take away the, the sin of the world, the one who is the son of God, that Holy Spirit will descend upon him like a dove. And that's exactly what happened after Jesus was baptized. So that's our proof. He said, I got, I got the proof that this is the one you all have been waiting for. Um, so uh, there were several purposes with that word of baptism, but it, it mainly is for preparation. It's to... Uh, get, get our hearts right to receive God, to receive Jesus um, as our Savior because we've fully repented. We've made that public uh, statement to all and we are completely ready uh, to receive what Jesus has for us. What does baptism represent? I think it'll be easier to maybe state what baptism is not for. Um, in a, another lesson, I talked about how it's not to remit sins uh, because when you look in Acts 2 and 38 where it says because of the remission of sins, that's letting us know that the water baptism was due to something that had already occurred. So it says uh, there, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that Greek word, uh, I mean, the word uh, for in that statement, um, the Greek word means because of. So you can read it that 
repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus because of the remission of sins. So you're being baptized because you've already, your sins have already been remitted. So there's no way that the water baptism can actually remit sins. Um, so when one repents, um, it's always in, required uh, that you're immediately forgiven. So then and then only is one a fit candidate for water baptism, which is it's basically that outward symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It testifies to the world that one has already repented and been forgiven by faith in Christ. So your repentance has already saved you. You've already been forgiven of your sins because of your repentance. That water baptism is just that outward symbol of it. Um, and we'll see that because water baptism is mainly just a figure only and a testimony, it's no, there's no way that it can actually save you. If you uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, you'll see it says, There is also an antitype, the like figure um, in the King James Version, which now saves us. Uh, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's testifying of the finished works of Christ. It's the figure, it's the symbol of what has out uh, happened inwardly. Um, and you also see that word also proves that baptism in water for men is not to remit sins, but that it is for the same purpose that Christ was baptized to testify of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If it was to remit sins, then Christ also had sins that had to be remitted, which he did not. Then the sins of men would need to be remitted or would not be remitted. And then if Christ had no sins to remit, then there was no point for anybody else to be uh, baptized. So Jesus experienced it as a figure of his death, burial, and resurrection. And for this same reason, believers are baptized in water. So water baptism is a symbol. It's a figure of something that has happened. So it's a figure of you already being saved. Um, it's also important to note uh, the light figure of baptism in water also saves us. Um, and a lot of people would, may wonder, how does it save us? Is it the water that saves or is it the things that it is a figure of? It wasn't the water that saved the eight persons of verse 20. So in verse 20, uh, it's saying, well, I'm going to start with, let me see. I'm going to start with 18, verse 18. Uh, for Christ also suffered once for his sins. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through the water. So um, when it's saying here, it was not water that saved the eight persons of verse 20. It was the ark that saved them from drowning in the flood. So baptism in water does not save the soul, but faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Christ is what saves um, that which baptism is a figure of. So a mere figure can have no power to save, but the reality of the figure can. Peter, lest some should trust in water baptism to save the soul, makes it very clear that baptism does not save one from the filth or moral depravity of the flesh. He shows it to be only the answer of a good conscience towards God, as we see in verse 21, that one has been made clean by faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is clear here that at baptism, the conscience is already supposed to be good and clean and baptism merely answers to it. As the waters of the flood could not have saved those eight persons in the days of Noah, had they not made use of the ark, so the water of baptism does not save the soul of anyone, but testifies figuratively to the salvation that comes by faith. So, Again, it's just making the point that salvation, uh, water baptism is not to remit sins. It's not for salvation. Um, your salvation occurs once you put your faith in Jesus and in the resurrection of uh, Christ. So when uh, a lot of people are talking about baptism, uh, 
they may be unaware that there's a bit of a formula. Um, and we'll see that in uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And there it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, where it says in the name of, it simply means by the authority of. Uh, and it's saying that there's it's by the authority of all three persons and not by the authority of Jesus only. He is the one authorizing us to recognize the others as well as himself. Um, this helps us to understand our next verse, uh, Acts 10 and 48 and some others as well. But it's basically by the authority of Jesus Christ that we baptize at all. And it is by his authority that we baptize by the authority of all three persons. So if we look at uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 48, it says, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Um, so when we're looking at that, it's not that they're being baptized in the name of Jesus only. It's just by the authority of the Lord who authorized to baptize in all three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Christ is the one authorizing and he's making it known that it's in all the name of all three, not just his name. He's not ignoring the Father and Holy Spirit. He's authorizing us to baptize by the authority of all three persons. Um, another question some people may have is, can I be baptized more than once? Uh, technically, yes, but it's because there are different types of baptism. Uh, and um, if you'll see that in Acts 19. Um, we must be baptized in the Holy Trinity. We're, we're baptized in Christ, we're baptized with water, and we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. So technically you do experience more than one baptism. Um, but you will. You, there's nothing in scripture that says you have to be baptized in water more than one time. Um, so if you were seven or eight years old and, and you went to church one day with your parents and and you got baptized that day, you baptized. <laughs> like you, you, you may have made that public seal and may not have understood the entirety of what it was and what it meant, but you still chose to be dipped in that water and be made alive in Christ. Whether you are aware of what happened, that's what happened. In Acts 19 verses one through five, um, it's basically showing how they had only been baptized in the name of God. So Paul was enforcing, you know, that formula previously stated in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we'll see that here. Uh, it reads, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ, Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So um, it's... If you look in verse 5, it's showing that they were baptized in water to conform to Christian water baptism in the name of those three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They had never been baptized this way because they had only known the name of God. For That's the only name that John knew to baptize in. Um, so that was the only name that he could baptize anybody who was, you know, repenting and wanting to be saved. Um, so... Again, in the name of simply means by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Um, so as far as rebaptism, there's nowhere in scripture that really says that um, you, you, you don't have to be baptized more than one time. So it's one and done. You're baptized. You've made that public seal. Um, you know, uh, once you're married, do you feel the need to have a ceremony? More than once. I guess some people do. They renew their vows. But a vow is a vow. Once you've made it, you're either going to break it or you're not. All right. Um, what do you have to do to be baptized? Um, it's going to have to be by a minister. 
um, and it will have to be in a body of water. So if you have recently been saved and you've recently repented and you would like to declare that with water baptism, uh, you would simply, if you're a part of a church, uh, just let your, your pastor, your minister, whoever's the authority, let them know that you would like to be baptized in water. Um, uh, most churches have, uh, baptism pools. Um, there are some who still like to baptize in natural bodies of water, like lakes, rivers, um, things like that. So, um, it just depends on what is the tradition, uh, for that church, for that particular congregation, but... Uh, you would simply just let a minister know that you would like to be baptized in water. And you can get that set up and you can make that public seal of the the inward salvation that has already occurred. All right. So if there's anyone um, who is looking to either receive Christ and be baptized into the body of Christ so that you uh, qualify to also receive water baptism, you can simply leave a comment below um, and someone will get back to you as soon as possible and be able to get that set up for you. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to leave that uh, in the comment section as well. And someone will get back with you uh, with that as well. All right. So I pray that this video, that this information is received well and that it helps you and edifies you. Uh, as much as possible in any way that it can. And um, until next time, I wish you all well and stay blessed.